welcome to uh, the October meeting of the DNA Interest Group. Uh, we have a Halloween-themed uh, program tonight. Uh, we also have some Halloween candy. We'll pass that around afterwards um, so that you're not snacking on it as we go through. Um, uh, after the presentation, uh, I would like folks to stick around uh, because I'd like to have your feedback on sort of the future of the DNA interest group, what you would like to see um, uh, in terms of this group moving forward. Um, uh, the students that are presenting tonight are students from the Personal Genome Learning Center, uh, and they have now just been recognized officially as a student organization at the University of Iowa. And so now we have uh, a Personal Genome Learning Center uh, as an official student organization. Uh, and so they'll be bringing this presentation tonight, and they would like some feedback as well in terms of um, this interaction between the Personal Genome Learning Center and community members that happens uh, monthly in this DNA interest group. And so uh, we would welcome your uh, opinions about uh, uh, where, how you would like to see uh, this group uh, persist into the future. So with uh, this being October and with this Halloween theme, uh, what uh, the students are going to talk about is transposal elements, the ghosts in our DNA. And so um, Monique Weaver will be starting us out on this, and we have uh, a few others that will uh, chime in as they go, th go through in this presentation. So thank you. All right, thank you guys for coming today. Um, so before I talk about our main subject of the presentation, I just want to go over some uh, core fundamental biology concepts so that I know we're at the, all at the same level for the presentation. Um, so in blue here, you can see uh, DNA, which is a double-stranded molecule that contains all the information um, for us to be able to live. And so this DNA, uh, the central dogma of biology is that DNA is transcribed into a single-stranded molecule called RNA, which is depicted in orange here, and that that is translated into proteins. Um, and proteins are important for uh, ma ma maintenance of your metabolism, for cell function, um, structural components. It basically does everything. So uh, proteins are very important, and DNA tells us uh, what proteins we need. So when we have mutations occur in this DNA, this can mess things up um, because it will then translate to the RNA when the RNA is uh, made, which results in non-functioning proteins. So we lose um, any proteins that are encoded by the section of DNA that's mutated. So one example of this is in the CFTR gene, which when mutated causes cystic fibrosis. Um, so this gene is on chromosome 7, um, and it, as you guys might know, uh, we have two copies of all of our chromosomes. Um, and so this, this disease is what's called autosomal recessive, which means you need two copies of a mutation to have the disease. So you have to inherit a mutation from your pater paternal side and your maternal side. Um, so that means two copies equals disease. One copy of the mutation means you're a carrier, and zero copies means no disease. Um, and so you can see an example of the most common cystic fibrosis mutation um, in the lower right-hand corner. Um, where the letters in green, the GAA, are deleted, which causes a loss of one of the amino acids in the protein, which um, causes the protein to lose its function, which results in the disease. So to show an example of um, how this can occur, uh, the inheritance of this can occur, is if the mother and father are carriers, which means they have one copy of a normal protein and one copy of the mutant protein. Um, they can pass any combination of these on to their children. So you'll get some children where they have zero mutations, uh, some children where they're carriers, just like the parent, where they have normal protein and then mutant protein, and then some where they have two copies and therefore they have cystic fibrosis. 
So 23andMe um, actually will test for the most common cystic fibrosis variant. And interestingly, I happen to be a, a carrier, so they will report if you um, have one of these variants. So again, I have one variant, which means I carry uh, this mutation, but I don't have the disease because I only have one. So now that we've talked about coding regions, um, let's talk about the non-coding regions, which is sometimes termed junk DNA. Only 2% of your entire genome um, encodes proteins, and the rest of it is non-coding regions, um, which scient uh, people uh, a while back termed junk DNA. Um, and this junk DNA can come about through uh, two methods from transposons, which make up about 50% of the human genome and 85% of the corn genome, and retroviruses, um, which are a type of virus that uses, that has RNA genetic information, so the single-stranded genetic information. So unlike what the name might suggest, uh, this junk DNA can actually be very important for evolution of organisms and for gene regulation. One example of the latter um, situation is a recent um, finding by a group in Ontario where they saw that a uh, mutation in the U1 gene, which despite what its name suggests, it doesn't actually encode a protein, but it is transcribed, so the DNA is converted to RNA, and this RNA um, is what's called a small nuclear RNA, and so it is important um, for processing RNA that is converted into protein. Um, and so this group found that when there was a mutation in this UI RNA, uh, that it led to misregulation of uh, many other proteins that resulted in a variety of cancers. Um, so this is just one example of how junk non-coding DNA can actually be very important um, for our cellular function and our health. Uh, so as I mentioned before, um, we, junk DNA can accumulate through transposons and retroviruses. There are two types of transposons, um, DNA transposons and retrotransposons, which use an RNA intermediate. And then there are also retroviruses, and there are two types of those as well, endogenous retroviruses, which um, our DNA sequences that are part of your genome, they were part of your parents' genome um, and your grandparents' genome, they uh, were inserted into the genome um, through ancient viruses that infected your uh, ancestors. Um, and then there are free-living retroviruses, which occur when you directly are infected by a, by a virus and their genetic information is incorporated into your genome. So we'll be referring back to these concepts throughout the presentation. So um, to give you some more information on transposons, they are also called jumping genes, and this is because they move from one location in your genome to another, so they jump around. Um, and they were discovered in 1948 by Barbara McClintock. Um, and when she first brought up the concept that your genome is actually not static but can move around, uh, the scientific community thought this was a crazy idea and didn't believe her. But then um, in later years, it was validated. And she was eventually awarded the Nobel Prize in 1983 for this discovery. So the uh, reason that she came up with this idea is from looking at corn. Um, so here you can see corn, and there are kernels where there is one main color, but then splatters of other colors. And so why this occurs is because there's a gene in the corn genome that uh, is responsible for the pigment. So that can either be the red or the purplish color. Um, and so transposons will insert into this pigment gene, which causes a loss of the color, which is how we get the yellowy white colors. So you'll see regions where we have um, mainly color and then a little bit of white, like there. Um, and so that occurs when a transposon is randomly inserted into the gene in those specific cells and you lose the color. 
Then there are also situations where the kernels had the transposon in the gene already, so they're all white, and then randomly the transposon, the sequence of DNA, is cut out and you lose, um, or you, the, the color returns. And so you can see that in some of the white colors where you have splashes of red. So there are two types of transposons. The class one are retrotransposons. Um, and there are two types of retrotransposons. There's long interspersed nuclear uh, elements, which stands for lines. Um, and this makes up about 20% of the human genome. And interestingly, only 1% uh, of these are actually active and able to move around in the genome. The rest are uh, inactive or dead DNA, or if you'd like, ghost DNA. <laughs> um, so then the other type is short interspersed nuclear elements um, or signs. And so you can see in the diagram, as their name would suggest, uh, lines are longer sequences, about 6,000 base pairs long, and then signs are 1 to 300 base pairs long. Um, and the other main difference between these is that active lines that can still move around in your genome uh, actually encode for the proteins that they need to, uh, to be inserted into a new location. Um, and signs do not have these proteins, and so they have to uh, rely on the lines proteins. But again, only a small portion of the transposons in our genome are still active and can move around. Um, so just to review what I have said about the composition of our genome, 2% of our genome is composed of coding genes. Um, then there's another 20% that's composed of long interspersed uh, nuclear elements, and then also 13% of short interspersed nuclear elements, um, and then another 8% of a, another type of retrotransposon, which I'm not going to talk about today, um, and then 3% of DNA transposons, which is the uh, um, class 2, um, and which does not use an RNA intermediate, and then the rest, uh, we have 26 that are introns, which are part of genes that code proteins, but they, um, they're cut out from the, from the sequence. Um, and yes. So the mechanism through which DNA transposons jump around is in a cut and paste mechanism. So we have a sequence of DNA in one uh, section of your genome and it is cut out, um, which results in a free piece of DNA that's not connected to your genome. And then it is inserted into another location of your genome. So you see it's inserted between these um, other sequences. And so you'll notice uh, that this is a cut and paste, and so we're taking one sequence, cutting it out, and putting it in another location. So it does not change the overall size of the genome. We have the same number of bases. Um, and so if we refer, refer back to the corn example, um, so what happens with these corns, say we have a, a red kernel, um, if a transposon is cut out from one location in the genome and inserted between the inside the pigment gene, breaking it apart and making it no longer functional, then we get uh, the loss of color. So um, the other type of, retrotrans uh, of transposon is retrotransposons, which use an RNA intermediate. Um, so if you remember what I talked about, the central dogma, the DNA is transcribed into RNA. Um, and so the retrotransposons use that first step uh, where there is a sequence in the genome and it is transcribed into RNA. But interestingly, this transcription process can be reversed um, using a protein called reverse transcriptase. So the RNA is actually converted back to DNA. And again, this is free DNA that's not connected to your genome yet. And then it's integrated into a new spot in the genome using a protein called integrase. Uh, so unlike the copy and, 
or cut and paste mechanism. This is a copy and paste mechanism, which means we still have our original sequence in the first location and the same sequence in a second location. So this actually increases the size of the genome. So this is um, one of the reason that organism genomes can get so large and why only 2% is important um, for encoding proteins. Uh, so um, I discussed retroviruses earlier as another mechanism for which uh, junk DNA can accumulate. Um, and so retroviruses actually use a similar mechanism to uh, insert their DNA as retrotransposons. So I'm going to turn the uh, microphone over to uh, someone else to talk about things. Okay, so I'm going to lean way over this thing and try to talk into it. All right, so we're going to be talking about retroviruses. Um, and so the, well, the most well-known retrovirus is HIV, so I'm sure. It's on. It wasn't on when you first got here, but it's on now. We can stand up. Oh, okay. <laughs> Didn't know how close I needed to be. That's fine. Okay, so one of the most well-known retroviruses is HIV. I'm sure you've all heard of it, so we're just going to go over a couple of things about it. Um, so HIV, will you can catch it like it's an infectious disease, and once you have it, you, it's like really, really hard to get rid of it because it puts itself inside of your genome, and then therefore you can pass it to offspring and you can pass it to other people because it's forever inside of you. Um, so what it does is it cuts your DNA and it kind of like pastes like glue itself in there, and then, um, yeah, I mean, it's in there forever. So transmission, sexual contact, contaminated needles, contaminated blood transfusions, and then, of course, from parent to child. So if you have it, you should probably not have children. Yep. So um, we mentioned that the HIV virus uh, inserts itself into our cells. It has to uh, insert itself into our genome in order to proliferate, proliferate. And so the question is, why does it have to do that? And so. Uh, to answer that question, we can examine the central dogma of biology again, uh, which is that generally in, in our cells, in, in human cells, um, we have DNA genomes which are transcribed into this RNA intermediate, which is tra translated into proteins. But in uh, retroviruses, uh, this is different in that the retroviral genome is an RNA intermediate. And so first of all, retroviruses have to trans transcribe their, DNA, their RNA genome back into DNA and then the second problem is that uh, the retrovirus is not a cell. It's just an envelope with uh, RNA uh, inside of it. And so it doesn't have the machinery to transcribe the RNA to the protein, uh, which would allow it to replicate itself. And so viruses, they have to hijack the machinery of other cells in order to uh, replicate themselves. And so that's why the RNA genome of a, of a retrovirus is very simple, but one of the genes, the, the Paul gene, has two protein, encodes two proteins. One is the reverse transcriptase, which uh, tra transcribes RNA back to DNA, and the other is this integrase uh, protein, which can insert the, the retroviral genome into our genome, and so it can pretend to be part of our DNA. Um, and so that's, that's also the mechanism of, of HIV, which is a, a retrovirus. Um, and then it has two other uh, genes, which uh, are, uh, encode proteins which, which are necessary to, to rebuild the virus inside of our cells so it can basically reproduce, re, like use our machinery to re, rebuild itself. Um, and, and so this is how it integrates into our genome. So the, the, if, if the right side is one of our cells, and then this is a retrovirus, it would infect our cells, it would bind to this, this the, the envelope of the retrovirus would, would bind to our cells with this protein. Uh, the CCR, bind to the CCR5 receptor, which um, Hannah will talk about later in the presentation. And then after it binds to our cells, it can inject its, its RNA genome into our cells. And so what it does is it, it reverse transcribes its RNA genome into DNA, and then it can take that DNA and using an integrase protein, which it already has inside of the virus, it can integrate its, its genome, which is DNA now, it can integrate that into our, our genome. And so it's, it's almost, it's, it's adding an element to our, our, our own genome. And so, um, yeah. 
So I'm just going to tell you guys really quick what are retroviruses. So they're RNA-based viruses that kind of intertwine themselves into our DNA, and they can infect a wide variety of organisms. Um, but like he said, they do rely on our cells to make new copies of themselves or to be passed on to other cells. Um, and then the genome integration, so it happens inside the cell's nucleus, and then the integrated genome of the, of the retrovirus is now called a provirus. Yep. And so sometimes, uh, so, so this is what happens it, uh, when we get infected by, by a retrovirus, and so that's why they're so hard to get rid of because they're, they're constantly infecting cells and, and replicating themselves. Um, but uh, so sometimes if, it's, it's very rare, but if a retrovirus infects uh, one of our germline cells, so we can imagine that one of our ancestors millions of years ago, a uh, retrovirus infected one of their sperm or egg cells. When it does that, it integrates into the genome of these sperm or egg cells into these germline cells. And then because those, those germline cells are what make up the, the DNA for the offspring, uh, the, this element which inserted itself into the genome is, is maintained um, through generations. And, and so, uh, so uh, over the next millions of years, so if, if this, this integration happened millions of years ago, over the millions of years up until this point, we would have acquired a number of mutations uh, in this inserted uh, retroviral element, in this endogenous retrovirus, which, which renders it largely inactive. And so, um, for the longest time, it, it, it was believed that these, these retro, and, and most of them are um, inactive. Um, but, but some of them actually can uh, re reproduce and, and make infectious viruses. And so. So there was a lab back in the early 2000s, I want to say 2006, and um, I think the scientist's name was Heidman. But what he did is he went into different people, different humans' genomes, and he took these bits of endogenous retroviruses that were already in there. It's not like they were infected with anything um, at the current time, but he took these that had been passed down for generations, and he put them all together, and he was able to make this virus that can actually still infect um, human cells. So he called it the phoenix virus because the phoenix is this mythical bird that rose from its own ashes. So those remnants of um, virus were able to come together and make a newly infectious virus. Um, and this virus encoded its reverse transcriptase, so it was able to replicate in mammalian cells. Um, and so in our own genome, because we have these retroviruses, recombination events um, can lead to the reactivation of them. So pretty scary stuff. Yep. And, and so um, these are some of the, the, the retroviruses that we've uh, acute, that have been accumulated, have been acquired over the last millions of years. Um, and so about 8% of our genetic code today is actually uh, composed of these retroviral elements. And, and most of them, the, the bulk of them were, were acquired in the evolutionary tree of primates. And, and so um, one thing that uh, knowing the, these, it, these retroviruses can be an, an indicator of evolutionary lineage. lineage. So for example, if we uh, were trying to investigate an organism which has the human endogenous retrovirus K uh, uh, in its genome but not W, then we, we could uh, assume that it's probably relate, closely related to New World monkeys. Um, but an, another interesting thing besides the evolutionary aspect is that uh, these retroviral elements um, have been linked to uh, multiple factors related to human health, um, uh, including disease. And so, um, how is it that these elements uh, can, can cause disease? Well, um, uh, even if they can't necessarily, be, because they accumulate mutations over time, they can't necessarily reform themselves and, and make new viruses, uh, there are still some aspects about the, the structure of these elements in our genome which can influence our, our biology. And so uh, if, if we look at the, the, these elements, um, the structure of these elements, uh, they're flanked by these two um, DNA sequences called uh, long terminal repeats. And these long terminal repeats can act like, like uh, promoters or enhancers, which basically means they can uh, cause transcription of, of genes. And, not, not, and sometimes they, they can promote transcription of our human genes that, that are close to them. And some of these hum, human genes that are close to these, these retroviral insertions can be oncogenes. 
And so the thing about these oncogenes is when their, their transcription is, is, is promoted, um, they, they can proliferate and, and, and uh, the cell can uh, keep dividing and it's a cell cycle thing and, and so it can make a tumor and so it, it, it can be a cancer thing. Um, the other thing is that uh, you can have expression of viral genes and so uh, look, thinking back to the central dogma, when you uh, transcribe the DNA and you make RNA, you get, uh, before when you express the genes, you get RNA. And if you get an accumulation of this RNA, that can cause an immune response. And we see that in some, some diseases. And then the third thing is that even though we acquire these, most of these uh, retroviruses acquire all these mutations over time, which render them largely inactive, um, some parts, some retroviruses, some re uh, endogenous retroviral uh, elements can, can still encode certain proteins. And so if they can still encode uh, one of these proteins, uh, like the, the envelope protein, for example, the, the buildup of this protein can uh, be detrimental uh, to our health. And so here's a, a, a nice uh, overview of, of how these uh, human endogenous retroviral uh, elements can, can influence our, our biology. And, and so, so you can see uh, if the green is the, what's inserted into our, our genome and it's next to an, one of our own oncogenes which are linked to cancer, then, then that could be a problem because the, it could uh, cause proliferation of that gene w when the, this element is activated or, or um, buildup of, build of RNA when transcription happens or uh, creation of these proteins which uh, can uh, cascade down to detrimental uh, effects. And so um, th these two, um, and, and, and so um, I think two examples which really represent how these uh, elements can, can cause, um, can be associated with or linked to disease or cause factors associated with diseases uh, are ALS and MS, uh, which are both linked to uh, uh, human endogenous retroviral elements. And so um, that we're going to go over um, AL, how ALS and MS are, are related to these human endogenous retroviral uh, elements um, as an example. And, and so we'll start with ALS. All right, so ALS is also known as Lou Gehrig's disease. Um, and it roughly translates to no muscle nourishment. So basically over time, um, your motor, motor, motor ooh, neuron death leads to the inability to control your muscles and um, there's two types so there's sporadic which makes up about 95 90 percent of the cases and there's familial which your dna can um, predispose you to so for the sporadic that's what we kind of think links retroviruses to als and um, so stephen hawking was like a famous person who had it um, and then our spooky fact is that military veterans are two times as likely to contract the disease um, than normal people, and there's no reasons why they haven't figured it out yet, but it's just a correlation. Yep. And so um, by, by doing uh, research into this disease, they found that uh, the, the ALS um, disease is associated with uh, the activation of one of these uh, elements that we've, we've acquired in our, in our genomes, uh, specifically the, the HERV-K uh, virus, which is one of the most recent insertions in our genome. And so how does the, the presence of this, this um, uh, endogenous retroviral element, um, how is it associated with the pathophysiology of this disease? And so what happens, and one of the things that happens in, in ALS is that um, the, since it, the, one of the, the genes is, is not mutated, so it's still active. And so uh, specifically the, the, the gene encoding the viral envelope. And, and so that's transcribed and you get a buildup of, of, of um, viral envelope proteins. And so the, the buildup of these proteins can disrupt cellular processes, which ultimately lead to neuron degeneration and ALS. Um, correlation, not causation, but. <laughs> It's, it's one of the things um, associated with the, the disease. Um, and so uh, multiple sclerosis is, an, is an, another example. Yeah, so multiple sclerosis um, is when your immune system actually attacks this protective covering that you have over your nerves. Um, so it usually starts off with you get numbness in the lower limbs or on one side of the body. Um, and then eventually you get vision problems and um, a lot of times people have a tingling sensation. Um, and then 
Multiple sclerosis is interesting because um, you kind of have waves of symptoms. So you'll, you'll have symptoms for a little while from days to weeks, and then they'll just kind of go away on their own. Um, and then you can have like this period of everything's great, everything's fine for months to years, and then it can flare up again, and this time it's worse. And then over time, it just keeps flaring up and getting worse and worse as it goes. Um, so the spooky fact about multiple sclerosis is people with autoimmune disorders such as type 1 diabetes, um, inflammatory bowel syndrome, and thyroid disease are more at risk for developing multiple sclerosis than people without those autoimmune disorders. Yep. And multiple sclerosis has been linked to another human endogenous retrovirus, and that's uh, Herve W, um, acquired about 25 million years ago. And so the, the presence of this um, element in, in our genome uh, it, it um, again, uh, the, the, the envelope protein is still transcribed and translated, and, and so uh, when you get a buildup of this protein, it can m mess with, with uh, cells in our nervous system, uh, which, which ultimately uh, leads to the degradation of um, this, this sheath on our neurons, uh, the myelin sheath, which is, um, well, it, it causes problems in our neurons, which which are associated with the disease. Um, and, and then another thing is that uh, the presence of uh, excess RNA could be inflammatory, and so that's another um, factor that can uh, be associated with uh, this disease. So something you can do if you have your DNA sequenced by 23andMe is you can actually look for some of these markers that predispose you to these diseases. So I'm stealing Hannah's genome here. and. Um, so the way to do this is you can go under your your name and then come on now. Ooh. Well, I'm missing a slide, that's fine. Um, you can find your raw data and you can enter these numbers. So these RS numbers are like the addresses for these traits or these disease. So if you put them in and you can see your like your ATs and Gs and Cs, and they'll tell you whether or not you have a higher risk or a normal risk of having this disease. So I just threw up a bunch of them on here just so you can see like there's a bunch of genes that can code for these diseases. And I mean, a bunch of them may be contradictory. Like you may have some that say, yeah, you're at high risk, but others say, no, you're not. Um, and there's just a lot of factors that go into whether or not you will get this disease or not. Yep, and so the presence of these, um, these, these elements in our genome are associated with a number of different diseases um, in addition to what we've talked about today. Um, but uh, it, they influence human biology in general, so they don't necessarily have to um, be linked to a disease. Um, they could also be, be linked to beneficial factors, perhaps, or, or other um, factors. And uh, we'll leave it to Hannah to tell you guys all about that. So thank you. All right, so I want to make sure everyone can hear me. So as, oops, as they were mentioning um, in that last slide, um, PTSD and alcoholism can actually be linked to these endogenous retroviruses. So it's been shown that stress, like the kind caused by PTSD, as well as uh, chronic alcohol abuse may lead to the activation of these different endogenous retroviruses. So as they were mentioning, many of these human endogenous retroviral elements actually still do have the potential to encode different viral proteins. And so the accumulation of these proteins, as they were just mentioning, has been linked to many different chronic diseases such as cancer, multiple sclerosis, um, various autoimmune disorders, as well as just seeing neuronal degeneration like you see in ALS. However, um, these endogenous retroviral elements don't always cause negative side effects. Um, so there are some very beneficial roles to having these endogenous retroviral elements in our genome. So for example, some of these endogenous retroviral elements have been incorporated as promoters for various important genes. So a promoter is basically a sequence that lets the gene to be expressed and to produce that protein, or it makes it be expressed with more ease. So one example of this is um, amylase, which is a enzyme, as shown here, um, that's like our molecular picture of it. 
Um, amylase is actually a enzyme that is expressed in the saliva, and it's involved in digestion. Another example of this is a endogenous retroviral element that has been incorporated into the bile acid CoA amino acid in acyltransferase gene, or BAT for short. Um, that's another enzyme that is involved in bile metabolism. So with the incorporation of both of these elements, we now have an increased expression of these genes, and they're better, they're better able to do their jobs. Uh, human endogenous retroviral uh, Sorry, human endogenous retroviral elements are also really heavily involved in development in humans. So one thing that scientists have found is that these elements are really highly expressed in embryonic stem cells. So embryonic stem cells are different cells that can make any other cell type in the body. So you find them really early in development. There's actually a lot of research going into them, maybe treat cancer. Um, it's a very exciting field. But it's been found that these endogenous retroviral elements are actually highly expressed in these stem cells, and that if you take them out, if you prevent them from being able to be expressed, these embryonic stem cells can actually lose their properties. They don't look the same, and they're no longer able to make whatever um, cell type they wish. Um, we've also found that human endogenous, endogenous retroviral elements can help embryos respond to viruses that they're exposed to during development. Um, we've also found, oh my gosh, this mouse does not like me. Um, we've also found that these endogenous retroviral elements are prevalent in all placental mammals. So this oldest herv L insertion that we're seeing here is found in all placental mammals. And so these retroviral elements are actually involved even more so in development. So what we found is that these elements are actually involved in creating a protein that's called um, syntycin. And syntycin is responsible for implanting, um, for, for helping with the implantation of the fetus into the uterus during development. Um, without this syntycin, it may not work correctly. Um, there's also a second version of syntycin, syntycin 2, which helps prevent the mother from reacting to the fetus as um, a foreign element. So when um, a baby is made, uh, the father's genomic elements or genomic information is given to the egg. Um, the body could potentially treat that as a foreign genetic element, therefore a virus, and could potentially go on and attack the fetus. However, this syntycin protein actually prevents that from happening. So it plays a fairly important role in development. Um, which just goes to show that having these endogenous retroviral elements is not always a bad thing. It doesn't always cause diseases. Sometimes it can be very important for the human life cycle. Um, but since we know what these endogenous retroviral what, what these endogenous retroviral elements are, we can kind of figure out how to treat some of the diseases that are caused by them. So right now, um, there is clinical trials going on for a treatment of ALS using antiretrovirals. So antiviral medication is what's used to treat HIV, so a retrovirus, and it pre it prevents the virus from moving around within the genome, and so. What kind of caused this to happen was there was a patient who was both HIV positive and had just been diagnosed at, for ALS. And so they were kind of skeptical on whether or not to continue taking their antiretroviral medication because why bother taking more medication if you're already going to pass away through ALS? Um, but the doctor encouraged this patient to continue taking their antivirals and they found that there was a complete reversal in ALS symptoms. So their normal gait returned, and they also saw um, less tremors, um, just a complete reversal of symptoms. And so from this discovery, there's now clinical trials for a treatment of ALS, um, something that we didn't previously have. There's also really cool clinical trials um, where they're using human endogenous retroviral elements to treat cancer. So the reasoning is, these elements at one time were viruses. If we can boost the expression of them, make them more prevalent, the body may act like, may treat them like viruses and therefore attack the cells where they're being expressed. So if you can make these tumor cells causing the cancer to express these endogenous retroviral elements, you could kind of trick the immune system into killing them. So we're kind of getting a lot of these really cool treatment elements through being able to study these. So. 
taking a step back from just specifically in, uh, retroviral elements, going back to transposons in general, your endogenous retroviral elements are not the only things that can cause disease in humans through these jumping genes. So actually, um, transposons were discovered in humans as a result of insertion into a gene that caused a case of hemophilia. And so through this insertion of the gene, doctors were able to figure out, okay, transposons are also present in humans. And so we now know that most of these diseases that are caused by transposons jumping around in your genome are actually due to this happening in germline cells, so egg and sperm cells, and that is most of the time depicted as a rare recessive disorder. Um, so to kind of harken back to what Monique was talking to, um, kind of what happens is you have a normal gene function that has a normal protein. Um, when you have a transposable element, like a line one, come in and insert itself into the gene, the gene is kind of broken apart and can no longer express that protein that it is meant to, which can result in a disease phenotype. And so one example of this, how this was discovered, was hemophilia, which is, of course, a condition where the ability of blood to clot is severely reduced. And so what will happen um, is we'll have transposable elements that will come in and land in this factor VIII gene, which disrupts the gene, and that prevents the blood from being able to clot correctly, resulting in hemophilia. Another um, kind of well-known example of this happening is in colon cancer. So there's this gene called APC, which is responsible for tumor suppression in the colon. Without the APC gene, uh, tumors are no longer expressed, and you start to see colorectal cancer. And so normally when this APC gene is disrupted, that happens through just a normal mutation like Monique was talking about earlier with the cystic fibrosis. A mutation happens, the gene is broken and can no longer work correctly. However, you can have the insertion of this transposable element into the APC gene, which essentially breaks the gene, and it can no longer function correctly, and that will lead to a lot of cases of colorectal cancer. Um, so these are not the only two examples of these diseases. There are many diseases that have been proven to be involved with transposable elements, such as severe combined immunodeficiency, porphyria, mus uh, muscular dystrophy, neurofibromatosis, Apert syndrome, Dent's disease, Walker-Warburg syndrome. There's a lot of these which are normally rare recessive disorders caused by just a broken gene, um, caused by mutation, that have been seen to be caused by these insertions of these transposable elements. So not only are our endogenous retroviral elements having effect on human diseases, transposons in general are sometimes involved in this. So if you remember, when we were talking about retroviruses, we talked a little bit about HIV immunity, so, or just HIV in general. Interestingly enough, there is a gene that causes people, or there is a way that people can become immune to HIV. So in certain European populations, there is a deletion. Um, HIV, when it comes to infect a cell, it binds to specific receptors, specifically the CD4 receptor and the CCR5 receptor. If one of these receptors is not present, HIV cannot bind to that cell, and then it can't enter the cell, and it can't enter your genome, and therefore cannot cause bad things to happen. Um, so in certain European populations, there is a deletion where the CCR5 gene has been deleted and is no longer present. And so we can actually look this up. If you don't have the CCR5 gene, you are not susceptible to HIV infection um, because you don't have the receptor, so it can't get into your cell. This is actually um, the location of the genome is, de is designated as RS333, but on 23andMe, it's designated as I300326. Um, so we can actually look this up. So like Kai Leakin was talking about earlier, you can do this by going into your 23andMe account um, and you select your name um, and it will pull down a drop down menu um, and you can select browse raw, browse raw data. And so what you can do is you can input the name of this location into the search bar and it will pull up what you have at that location. And so you can have one of two possible things. You can have a dash, or you can have that sequence of letters as is listed under variants. Uh, the dash indicates that you have the deletion, and the series of letters indicates that you do not. So if you were to see two dashes there, that means that you have the deletion on both of your chromosomes, and therefore are not susceptible to HIV. 
I unfortunately only have one deletion, and on my other chromosome, I have the gene, so I'm still susceptible to HIV, unfortunately. Um, but what's the takeaway from all of this? So tonight, we've kind of discovered or kind of hoped to impart this information that not everything in the genome kind of conforms to this idea of the central dogma of biology. Not everything goes from DNA to RNA to proteins. Um, there is some variation here. We've also kind of covered that your genome is not as static as was once thought. There are things that are jumping around in your genome, kind of like ghosts. They're not truly alive, but they're not also dead. They're still moving around. Um, retroviruses are an example of this, and they do this by replicating themselves and putting them into your genome to do this. And so these ghost retroviruses that we have in our genome that no longer make real retroviruses, they can still move themselves around to different places. And so these ghosts, as well as other transposable elements, have been proven to be involved in different diseases, and we can kind of see that um, by looking at the research as well as looking into 23andMe, and we can kind of figure out more about what we have and what we've encountered in our history. So thank you guys for listening. Um, if anyone has any questions. Or wait, so Dr. McAllister will come around with a microphone so we can get everything recorded. So why don't we just uh, first thank our speakers. <laughs> and then you guys can go to those microphones. So all of you can go to those microphones. And then if you have a question, uh, then you can ask a question. I'll bring you this microphone. So this will be the part on Q&A in regards to the presentation. And then uh, after this, we'll have a discussion. I have two parts to my question. One is, uh, what role do you feel uh, the new technology of CRISPR would have in remedying any of these things you've presented tonight? Uh, that's probably a four-hour question to answer. <laughs> but then the other is more specific. I'm curious about the Epstein-Barr virus and its role in anything about what you've talked about tonight. I've heard it uh, being claimed that things such as Ehlers-Danlos hypermobility is associated with like late stage Epstein-Barr virus from the inserting and moving things around. I don't know. It was by uh, Anthony Williams who's got four books out. So I'm just curious if you would have a comment on that as well. I can answer the first part. So um, scientists all over the country and the world are investigating CRISPR to, um, as a method to treat and cure any genetic diseases. So those include ones like cystic fibrosis, where it's a small mutation in the gene. Um, but yes, once, once it's perfected as a method for tr uh, curing genetic diseases, it could also be applied to these viral elements and trans transposon elements that um, are either inserted in the gene or a ca cause an accumulation of proteins that causes diseases. Um, so yes, it could be a future method, but we're still in the early stages of CRISPR as a, a method to treat these. So how could, how could you envision CRISPR being used to treat the examples that you, you have? Oh, okay. So, um, so how CRISPR works is that there is a guide RNA that matches a certain sequence in your DNA. So for example, you'd make a, a guide for the um, cystic fibrosis gene, and so it will bind to that region of the DNA, um, bringing the CRISPR protein there, and it has a, a certain part of the protein that can cut the DNA. And so once the DNA is cut, the cell has um, machinery, other proteins that are important for repairing it because it doesn't want to just have pieces of its DNA cut up and floating around. Um, and so this can work in two ways. It can either take both ends of the DNA and just stick them back together. Um, and this can sometimes result in small single mutations. Um, 
And so this can be one way to cure small mutations like the cystic fibrosis mutation I talked about. Um, but as far as applying it to these large like transposons being inserted into the middle of a gene, uh, there's another method to repair breaks in DNA, which is homologous recombination. And so that's where, um, as I discussed, there are two copies of all of your sequences because you have two chromosomes, one from each parent. And so if one chromosome is cut, then the other chromosome can act as, um, as a, a template for the other molecule to be repaired. Um, and so if we use CRISPR to cut the DNA and also insert copies of the uh, correct gene that doesn't have the transposon in the middle of it, those copies can be used to return the DNA to um, the non-mutant form. So I was going to add, there was a scientist last year who claimed to have um, used CRISPR technology to edit the genomes of two twins who were, um, their parents had HIV, and they wanted their twins to, they wanted the CCR Delta 5 um, receptor that um, a lot of people have deleted, or a good chunk of people have deleted where they are immune, so he claims that he deleted this receptor, this gene that codes for this receptor, um, in these twins that would now make them um, resistant to HIV. There's some controversy. Nobody knows if he actually did it or not. This was in China, so they, their regulations on genome editing are a bit lax compared to ours. Um, and a lot of people are trying to disprove him right now, so it's still kind of up in the air. And a lot of people don't agree with this um, quite yet. I can kind of across, address the Epstein-Barr question. Um, so please correct me if I'm wrong. I, have you taken? Anyways, um, I don't believe it's a retrovirus. I, Multiple sclerosis. It can cause. Yes, it is. It is? It is a retrovirus. Never mind. I am wrong. <laughs> it's, it's not a retrovirus itself, but it is. it can be linked to multiple sclerosis. Um, and there's something about... We discussed this last night. Yeah. <laughs> there is a linkage between it and the um, HERV K. Yeah, I think maybe it activates it somehow. Yeah. Yeah, not entirely. There, there is a connection, but it's not, there's not a lot of studies done on it yet. So your book may be a better uh, resource. Yeah, probably. <laughs> Other questions? Anybody else have any questions? Okay, well, thank you very much.